Sydney for the introduction. Um, I was here about a year ago and I was talking about uh, my efforts to produce numbers that were more reliable, safer mathematically, and could get more just rock solid results. I also am aware that a lot of people don't need those rock solid results. They need something that is good enough and as fast as possible. In fact, the number of people who want that is probably out the numbers the people who want mathematically perfect answers, maybe 100 to 1. So what I call floating points gain is the minimum quality you can possibly stand, but as fast as possible, guessing your way through a calculation. That's the game I'm referring to. So I said, well, I can do that. I can actually beat floats at their own game by redesigning the arithmetic that goes back three decades that we all depend upon now, the IEEE standard. Let me talk about the memory wall. I think you all know it. Sometimes it's good to review the numbers just to see how bad this is. <coughs> Sometimes I, I tell people that if you, if you, if you did your workday the way a computer does, you'd commute for four hours, work for five minutes, and commute back to home for four hours. Because that's the ratio of moving data around to actually doing something work-wise. Work but I think this is about as simple as I can make the chart. Just if you are doing a floating point multiply add, it takes about 200 picojoules, 0.2 nanojoules. But to read memory from the, if you're actually getting it from DRAM and not from cache, that's 12 nanojoules. All of your energy, all of your cost of, of actual equipment, and all of your time is being spent moving data. So that's the issue. And I started this journey many years ago thinking, well, how can we make the data that we move more meaningful? Because we're going to have to stop being sloppy about just pouring 64-bit numbers around everywhere if we don't need that much. I have a hobby, and it's the hobby that Sydney referred to, and she said, I ask a question. The question is, how do you know your answer is correct? I just love to see the reaction I get. I can almost histogram the reactions I've gotten over the, over the years. The most common one by far is kind of nervous laughter and, well, well what do you mean? Or, sure, I don't know. <laughs> and sometimes, well, we use double precision, so it must be the right answer. Uh, oh, we always get that answer. Or other people get that answer. So actually, there's very little numerical analysis left in the computing community. We don't use numerical analysts anymore. No one can find them. Uh, no one, even if we could find numerical analysts, uh, the Berkeley School says you have to go through every single line of your code and prove that your rounding error is under control. I have never seen people do that with a million line code, uh, or even a hundred line code for that matter. It's just very, very rare. I'm going to be talking a lot about precision versus accuracy, so I want to make sure you understand how I use those two words, because I see a lot of confusion in the, in, in the way we do it. Precision versus accuracy. Here's a picture that's very high precision but very low accuracy. Do you even recognize who this guy is? Probably not. It's a terrible drawing. This so is this guy, Abraham Lincoln. But that's very low precision, very high accuracy. All those grayscales are just what they should be, but it's only 432 pixels instead of 150,000. A lot of what we've gotten into the trouble of doing is that we're using a huge number of, of a lot of precision, but it's not very accurate. It's not giving us the right answer, and we don't have any way in the number of knowing how accurate it is. And I've seen people propose alternatives, but they, they tend to result in these discussions that are more heat than light. Of, I've, got a, I've got a system that's called rational arithmetic, or I've got a system that's this, and it's going to solve all the problems. I say, well, what, what are your measures? What are your metrics for a number system? And we need to have a sound set of, here's how we're going to compare one way of doing things with another, or else we're not really doing science here. We're not even doing engineering. Well, one way is just figure the relative error of your calculation, which is you can do absolute error, just what's the absolute value of the difference between the right answer and the answer you got. But it probably makes more sense to divide it by the answer you should have gotten so you get relative error because we're dealing with very big and very small numbers in most floating point calculations after all. The dynamic range of a system. You can easily get a very high accuracy if you don't care about having very much of an exponent range. There's a kind of a trade-off between dynamic range and accuracy if you look at the way the bits are, are laid out inside of a number. So you, if, you, if you make sure you're uh, not cheating on the dynamic range, uh, we, we do need both. And if you have the relative error, you take the log of it, and if you have like a, a relative error of 0 .001, that's three decimals of accuracy. So take the log base 10 and negate it, and that's how many decimals of correct accuracy number you got. So we have a feel that single precision is about seven decimals and double precision is about 15 decimals. 15 decimals. That's crazy. 
than the percentage of operations that actually wind up exact. How often can you do a plus or a minus or a divide or a times and actually land on another system, another number within your vocabulary and not have to round it all? That'd be something interesting to know. And then when you do make an accuracy loss, how much did you lose? How many decimals did you lose from your answer? If you want to think about the um, Shannon type of, al of, of metrics, how much information is there per bit? When I look at the floating point numbers that, that uh, applications produce, when you're doing these big data stuff, you'd be surprised how low the entropy is. It's not very high, which means you're like, the exponent bits almost never change. It's, it's, it's not nearly as much information as you think you're, you're using. And that's a huge waste if you've got petabytes of data that you're spending time to store or to move over a network. And then there's accuracy benchmarks. Like you, I could build up to simple formulas and say, how many decimals did you get correct? Do linear equations, do FFTs, do other math kernels and say, how many decimals did you get right? Let me give you some memes that to show you just how far we've gotten from where we should be. Here's computers in the era of the IEEE standard, 1985. Remember that, those days? Some of you weren't born yet, but that's, that's what computers used to look like. This is what computers look like now. They are a thousand times smaller and a thousand times cheaper, or say, a million times cheaper per transistor. But the IEEE standard was designed for very expensive transistors. That's what the arithmetic looked like when they designed the IEEE standard for single, double, and extended precision. Fast forward to 2017. This is what arithmetic looks like now. Something's wrong here. The only other part of technology I know that has stood still this long without updating with massive changes of Moore's Law type advances is the QWERTY keyboard we all type on. We're still doing the same keyboard layout we had 100 years ago. Well, the floating point as we use now is derived from a 1914 idea of a separate exponent and a separate fraction register, and that's it. Another analogy I give people is the way we used to do printouts. This is a printout from 1970. The old timers will recognize when we used to have uh, light gray on lighter gray, uh, all capital letters, monospaced, and it went chug, 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 a line at a time, and we were happy to get one page in 30 seconds that way with a ribbon that was always worn out. Um, IBM discovered laser printing in the early 60s and got very excited about it because they wanted to produce that, except they wanted to produce three pages per second. They were so excited that they could have horrible looking printout that came out of the printer so fast that the paper flew through the air and they said, now we can finally keep up with the CPU. It did not cross their minds, as it would the mind of Steve Jobs, let's say, that maybe people are still willing to wait 30 seconds for their printout, but they'd like it to be full color, full bleed, two-sided, you know, with all kinds of graphics capability and not just a bunch of capital letters that are monospaced. So this is what eventually happens to most technologies. It, 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 they become we do more in the time we are willing to wait. The, the actual thing we, we attempt expands. We do not do things in less and less time. But engineers always instinctively think, oh good, I'll be able to do this in a tenth of a second now instead of one second. No, you're going to do something ten times as big and you're going to still take one second. That's what always happens. But it hasn't happened to arithmetic. So the challenges for the existing arithmetic is to upgrade a storage inefficient 1980s era design that we are all locked into. Uh, the only thing I've seen that says wrenching is back in the old days there used to be a, a format for characters called EBCDIC, E-B-C-D-I-C, Extended Binary Code for Information Interchange. That was the IBM standard. That was before there was ASCII. I guess we're kind of making the transition from ASCII to Unicode now. But uh, when you change a character set and everybody has to go through that, for a while you have to have both character sets and then eventually you kind of drop the old one and, and then you can move on. But right now, the existing arithmetic there's no guarantee of repeatable or portable behavior. You can't move it from one system to another. And people are astonished when I tell them, you can run the same problem on one machine with the same data, five seconds apart, and get a different answer to your floating point problem. And the standard does not stop that from happening. In fact, it encourages it. It says, well, if you every once in a while can get a little bit more precision with some hidden bits in your machine, absolutely do that. But you have no idea why the answer is now different because you don't know which one is the right or more accurate answer. Because 32-bit is, is kind of inefficient as, at the accuracy, it, that's why everybody's going to 64 bits. We're using twice as much data for a lot of things. The IEEE standard does not obey the laws of algebra. I'll show you an example of that. It doesn't have the associative or distributive law. So if you're not 
If you're not doing a good imitation of mathematics, you've already got a very shaky foundation for most of your calculations. That's not true for integers. Integers on a computer are rock solid. That's why people get the impression, oh, computers don't make mistakes, computers don't lie. Well, that's only if you're dealing with integers. If, if you're working with floating point, they, they do lie, and they do it incredibly quickly at petaflops per second. Anyway, very poor handling of all of the things that can go wrong in a calculation. Overflow, underflow, not a number. They put a lot of stuff into the standard that no one really makes use of, and it's not, it's not really available in standard computer languages, so how would you ever see it? And the dynamic ranges are way too large, which means they stole bits that you could have used for more accuracy, and that's probably what you really needed. Uh, when you do make a rounding error, you can't see it in the number. It's invisible. It's hazardous. People have lost lives because of floating point errors. Billions of dollars have been destroyed because of bad rocket launches or because of oil platforms collapsing because they didn't calculate correctly. And it's because no one knows how accurate these calculations really are. And when you parallelize them, when you say, here's a serial code, I'm going to now run it in parallel, you get a answer, different answer. I just spoke at CSIRO uh, two weeks ago, and it was a room full of 160 people who were doing big data, and almost every one of them was having the problem that when they submitted a problem to the cloud, they could not get the same answer twice. I bet that's true for a lot of people in this room as well. You've almost gotten so you don't expect to get the same answer twice, you tolerate that. But we used to be able to get repeatable answers on computers if you give them exactly the same data, but not, not anymore. Here's a simple example of just how bad things are, and I won't burden you with a lot of these, but here's a dot product of two vectors A and B. They're only four elements long. I'm going to take the product of 320 million, 1, negative 1, 80 million. These are not huge numbers. They're easily expressible in single precision without any rounding error. You can express these numbers as, as integers. They're fine. So in single precision, if you take the dot product, you get zero. And you might say, well, let's check that and do it in double precision. So you do it, and you get, again, zero. Trust me. Try your calculator. It'll give you zero. Then you, if you're really conscientious, you might say, well, let's try something from left to right and from right to left. Let's try it with a binary sum collapse. You get zero. The correct answer is two. Hmm. And this is only four long. Now think of how much linear algebra you do on a computer and how often you depend upon large matrix things like singular value decompositions if you're doing big data. But you can't do linear algebra with floats. All linear algebra is unstable with floats. By the way, I'm very happy to uh, share all of these slides, post them, put them on the web, and we can do that through the conference, or, or, or I'll do it personally if you have any trouble getting the slides, but I'm always totally open source with my slides. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm just getting warmed up on the IEEE 754 standard. As I say, no guarantee of identical results across systems. There are hidden guard bits that you can have that will really wreak havoc with, with your repeatability. This is a guideline. It's not a standard. So there's no reason to really stick with it. If you can't get repeatable results, why does it get to call itself a standard? It's got a set of requirements, recommendations, and good to have. Well, that's a guarantee that everybody's going to have different implementations, right? And a lot of vendors, including all the ARM people, are ignoring some of the requirements now. So you don't even have the requirements standardized. Those are the laws of algebra I mentioned as, not, as breaking uh, associative and, and distributive law. And when you overflow to infinity, how many digits did you lose? All of them. I mean, that's an infinite error. Why did they say, let's round, this number is big, let's round it up to infinity? Yikes. So I call IEEE floats weapons of math destruction. They are totally destroying people's ability to get repeatable uh, answers, and they're just, everyone's relying on libraries. Well, we hope somebody worked this out so we can just use this routine and that it's safe. We don't have the expertise here locally, but we'll trust that this routine's been used in, uh, long enough that it's safe. I got one more page of these. What else is wrong? Well, as I say, the exponents are usually too big. The accuracy is flat across a vast range. If you know that something's like 10 to the 300th power, is it likely that you also want to know exactly 15 decimals worth of how, what that number is? Or do you just say, wow, it's a big number? Human beings tend to put things close to one in terms of their uh, uh, dynamic range as much as possible when we talk about them. If we had to do a, a chemical calculation in femtoseconds, 
we wouldn't have every number be 10 to the minus 15th times something very precise. We'd start talking about femtoseconds and bring things back into the range. But there's actually another better mathematical reason why things tend to gravitate towards uh, an exponent of zero, which is the central limit theorem, theorem of mathematics. Statistics. Subnormal numbers, this is when you underflow, gradual underflow. If you've done any kind of uh, real close examination of what happens to very small numbers, it's a headache for the designers. It can add 30% to the size of the chip. Divides are messy. They're not, the, they're not symmetric with multiplies. Like, add, subtract are very symmetric. Same speed, same hardware. But divides are much harder than multiplies. You got all these wasted bit patterns. Negative zero? Negative zero? Really? I, I mean, the people on the committee, I just want to shake them. Uh, did their educations fail them? There is no such thing as negative zero. But they distinguish between negative and positive zero. And then there's a whole bunch of not a number types. In fact, in double precision, there are that many ways to say something is not a number. That's an awful lot of wasted bit patterns. You could have doubled the dynamic range if you'd actually used those numbers to mean something. So I picture the 1980s people clustering around this, you know, this, <laughs> this idea of a sine bit, an exponent bit, and a mantissa. And there's people who are talking about, uh, let's have more exponent bits because that'll save transistors. It's a lot easier to build an exponent than it is to build a fraction because you have to multiply the fraction part. You just have to add and subtract the, oh yeah, those transistors are really so expensive. And my company wants to use guard bits. This is the original corruption that came from actually Intel. Intel had an 80-bit uh, extended precision register they thought would make their coprocessor, the 8087, better. And so they insisted that it be in the standard, and so they would have the high moral ground that their calculations were better than other people's calculations. That was the beginning and the root of not repeatable answers across systems. And it caused a lot of people, uh, of grief for the people like who tried to make Java repeatable, right? Write once, run anywhere, get the same answer. Even now, that you can't say that with uh, floating point in Java. IBM had a fuse multiply ad. They wanted to make sure everybody had a fuse multiply ad. That way they'd have a head start and they would make everybody conform to what they already had. So you can get the idea of all these stupid kind of committee decisions. These are about mathematical issues. But they're, they're b making the, dis the uh, this choices based on, well, what's easy for my hardware engineers? What does my company already build? How can we make things difficult for other companies? That's what caused the committee to spend six years like wrestling over where to put these things. This is not mathematics. This is nothing like, well, have you ever seen an IEEE standard for integers? What would it say? Like a paragraph, get the right answer, right? You, this, is only, this kind of stuff only happens when you've got a lot of really bad choices and you have to choose which one is the least bad. That's when you get arguments like this. Kind of a cartoon. I just want to give you a feel for how we got where we are. There's two aesthetics I would point out. There's the rounded, cheap, uncertain, but good enough for your calculation. And then there's the rigorous with more work, certain and mathematical, which as I said for the last couple, three years, I've been working on the right hand side. But now I've decided to, with vengeance, go after IEEE floats. The IEEE standard covers both floats and their equivalent for rigorous work is an interval. You put two numbers and say there's a closed interval here and the answer is definitely guaranteed to be in between there. And people who try interval arithmetic usually only try it once because their answer comes out to be minus infinity to infinity. Uh, and it's true, your answer is somewhere in there, but it's very easy in the hands of a, of a novice for interval arithmetic to produce these grossly large expansions during your calculation. They don't confine the answer right. But they did put in things like, well, how can we help people control rounding error quasi-automatically? Let's put in different, four different rounding modes and let people try that. Let's put in, uh, they put in a lot of little tricks into the IEEE standard that slowed it down. And this is perhaps why you now hear discussions of approximate computing. Maybe we could do even sloppier work than IEEE and get faster. Well, you've already got approximate computing and it's pretty approximate. And that is the, the current floating point you use. It, you can't get too much worse than it is and still get any kind of answer at all. But what really bugs me is that the IEEE standard is full of things that are trying to make the answer very more rock solid. And make up your mind. Do you want mathematics and provable answers or do you just want good enough and fast? If you mix the two aesthetics, you wind up getting something that's not as fast as it could be and it's certainly not rigorous. You can't, still can't trust it. People say they need the hardware to protect them from not a number and overflows and things like that in their code. 
I say, well, gee, do you keep the debugger mode running when you have production software? You turn the debugger mode on to protect you from this, see what's going on until you can finally stop the error conditions from occurring in your code. When you finally make it impossible for those error conditions to occur, then you turn off the debugger, triple the speed of the code, and say that's the binary that ships, right? But right now people are asking that the debugger constantly be running on their floating point hardware. So I'm introducing something I call a posit. Posit is sort of a polite word for a guess because all floating point numbers that round are guesses, actually. Of course, you don't have uh, absolute uh, certainty that it's the right number. But in philosophy, a posit is a statement that is made on the assumption that it will prove to be true. I'm going to call a, a cert, uh, a, one of these approximate numbers a posit, and the, the equivalent in interval arithmetic is called a valid, but I'm not going to talk about that here. This is the fundamental diagram of posit arithmetic. If you saw me talk a year ago, I had a diagram like this. I called them type 2 unums, but I didn't know how to populate the circle with other numbers besides well, you, sh you see here the basic framework, but I, the only way I could actually make hardware for it was to do table lookup. And I said, I don't know how to make this hardware friendly. Had a breakthrough last December, December 2nd, December 3rd is when it finally hit me. I knew how to make this as friendly as building floating point arithmetic is currently on a, on a, um, on a machine. So this is as simple as the signed integers. In fact, it maps directly to normal signed integers. Now there's a point up at the top, one zero. What does that mean as a signed integer? Well, if you were counting as an integer, you go zero, one, negative two, negative one, and back to zero. It overflows, an integer overflows right at that point where it hits one followed by a bunch of zeros, which is sometimes a source of bugs. But that's just the way modulo arithmetic works. That's also exactly the point where you flip over from positive infinity to minus infinity. So it's got the same confusion that you have with integers. But uh, you can actually have as few as two bits and actually make a, a useful number system out of this. So there's definitely no negative zero. But let me start to fill in a number for you, okay? I hope you can see this. I'm going to start between one and infinity, I'll put four. I could put two. I could put no, uh, several numbers. And then it's mirror imaged with one fourth on the bottom and negative four on the left. So this is the rule. Is you reciprocate by flipping horizontally and you negate by flipping vertically which is really nice because it's just two's complement arithmetic and we know how to do that super fast. That number that's right there at the northeast point I call u seed and it's two to the two to the es where es is the number of exponent bits. Okay, I know I can see you glazing over already. A better thing is to just show you how the circle fills in. Okay, between four and one I can put two because I've got space for another power of two. Between 4 and infinity, well, let's multiply by 4 again. Let's keep doing that. The closer I get to infinity, I'll just keep multiplying by 4. But if I want to fill in a point between two powers of 2, if there's a power of 2 in between, I'll put 1 there. What if there's no power of 2, like between 1 and 2, what would you put in there? How about 3 halves? Makes sense. Between 1 half and 1, I'll put 3 fourths. And that's the first time I don't have perfect reciprocation because three-fourths and three-halves are not perfect reciprocals. But for all the powers of two, and for that matter, for zero and infinity, straight up and down, you get the reciprocal. And it's as symmetrical for multiplication and division as it is for addition and subtraction. This is starting to look like mathematics to me. But the crazy thing about this, and the elegant thing is, the more I add bits to the right, see, the dynamic range goes up automatically but the accuracy goes up automatically on the left and the right. So north and south you get more dynamic range and left and right you get more accuracy. And all I'm doing is adding bits to the right like you would with an extended fraction, extended decimal, I mean. It's not like I have to poke stuff over here into the exponent part and figure out where should that exponent end. So that is the kind of equivalent. I, I've made it look as much like an IEEE uh, float as I can here, but it starts out with a run of bits that are all identical bits, the regime bits. So if you have a run of ones, let's say one, 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 followed by a zero, that's a unary way of, of notating what power of the U seed you're at. And that tells you exactly where you, how close you are to the very northern part of the, of the circle. Same thing for the bottom part of the circle, where it's, it begins with a string of zeros as you get very, very close to zero. And that, that gives you a power that gives you a huge dynamic range. So there's just a choice of, of, of a few values that you can use that work. But, uh, uh, for an example, I'll, I don't want to go through this, but uh, I, I do want to mention 
you can't overflow these guys. They do not overflow. You never round to infinity. For that matter, you really should never round to zero. If you find yourself needing a kind of an underflow situation, it's very easy to do it in your software. You know, like add one to a number, subtract one. There, now it's zero. <laughs> if it was really small, that's what's going to happen. But the, the, the bombshell is that these circuits are simpler than what you're using now. So not only is it better mathematically, it's faster and it's smaller silicon. It's less latency. You can put more processors on a chip. And that made me realize floats are dead. It's just a matter of time. They have nothing to recommend them at this point, except for the fact that they're everywhere. We have this gigantic legacy that we have to get rid of. It's sort of like the transition from serial to parallel processing. It took a long time for us to keep code running in parallel. But it's not like we thought that parallel processing was a really bad idea. Really. Well, some people still do, I guess. So here's what I, why I say we should try to represent these reals. So we've done some studies, and it's really hard to find too many cases where you go outside the range of 10 to the minus 13th to 10 to the 13th in your dynamic range. Now, even single precision gives you like 10 to the minus 45th to 10 to the 38th power. And don't even get me started on double precision, because it's like 600 orders of magnitude. You do not need 600 orders of magnitude in one calculation. It's, uh, as I say, it's there because the hardware engineers find it easier to do that than to give you a more accurate number. The central limit theory, however, says that exponents are always going to do this to you. And here's what IEEE float accuracy does for single precision. It wobbles a little bit. There's always wobble because you're approximating an exponential by a bunch of straight lines, and that's the wobble in the accuracy. And over there on the left, that's gradual underflow. When you hit the smallest uh, exponent, it gradually slides down to zero, and they thought that was very clever when they uh, came up with it. But there's nothing over on the right that slides down. It's not symmetric. All the NAND values are over there on the right, by the way. This is not a number. This is not a number. This is not a number. So <laughs> this is not what we need. We do not need flat accuracy. What we need is something more like that. That magenta curve is posit accuracy. It puts all the extra bits of accuracy right where you need them, but it actually has a larger dynamic range than floats. Or I can get a, the same dynamic range and, and improve that peak, but it always pokes like that. But that's only one advantage of posits over floats. These things are designed mathematically. So one-to-one -one map of binary integers to reals. If you have an instruction that says, is this integer equal to this integer? And of course, all computers do. You have to right now have a separate instruction for, is this float equal to this float? Because it's got all kinds of extra conditions. Well, zero is equal to negative zero. And if it's a NAND, then it's not equal to anything. And you know, junk like this means you have to have a separate set of instructions. What about x less than y? If you can compare two integers, x and y, it's the same instruction for posits. If the integer is less, x, x over y, as a, thinking of it as an integer string, it's also true for the posits. So you actually save instructions because they work exactly like you would like. So you've probably written through these already, but they're perfectly reproducible. They're as reproducible as integers. And they obey the mathematical laws that I said were broken earlier. Here I'll do a study. Now I'm going to take it all the way down to eight bits because I can compare an 8-bit float exhaustively, 256 possible numbers. And I'll take like an addition table with 256 by 256, that's a big addition table, but I can actually check every single number out and I can do a comparison. What would it be if we had floats versus if we had posits? And uh, you can see it's got, a, it's got a little dynamic range, it's a little, I call it a quarter precision float that you can actually play with these things. And it, it, it's one of the best ways to, to compare a number system is to turn the precision way down so you see all the ugly warts. They, they come to the surface. So here is the way the accuracy looks for the set of positive numbers. And you can see it goes as low as half a decimal over there on the left. But mostly it wobbles between, uh, I think it's about 1.3 and 1.4, something like that, 1.55 decimals. So then, of course, it drops off completely. Here's what it looks like for 8-bit posits. And it, you can see it tapers on both sides. And it has a higher average, and it has a higher maximum. I can put both side by side so you can see. I've got seven orders of magnitude, by the way, instead of five, just out of an 8-bit number. I look at these graphs. I call these Simpson plots. Can you see why? Yeah. Reminds me of these guys. The, the badly behaved Bart versus, I guess, the goody two-shoes. Lisa, 
but uh, you, that's what you want is, is something like a more rounded situation. If I put them right on top of each other, you can see that the only place where floats are better than posits is just before you overflow or underflow. And most algorithms do not spend any time there. I can match the float dynamic ranges since I say, well, okay, it's going to be a drop in replacement. I want people to be able to just say, compile and use these instead of these, and everything should just work. So the, the changes for, the, for the, the people who write applications should be zilch. Should be just about as invisible as going to the hardware store and buying an LED light bulb instead of an incandescent, and you just screw it in, and now you get more light and it uses less energy. That's the goal. I, I will have to rewrite some uh, libm.h math library so that you can still link to stuff that does all the, the calculations, right? But other than that, it should just be a matter of just use them. They should, they should work. But I want to talk to you a little bit about deep learning in neural networks because we made an interesting discovery. You need something called a sigmoid function when you're doing deep learning. Has to, you need a something that goes a transition from zero to one as a neuron goes from on to off. And it has to be a gradual one. People have done all kinds of tricks like, well, let's just go flat and then ramp up and then go to, you know, or, or, or go, keep on ramping up. Approximations that don't converge very well and they can completely die. You need some kind of a gradient from minus infinity to infinity. And so what they uh, often recommend is the sigmoid curve of one over one minus e to the minus x. One over one plus e to the minus x. And that's the green curve shown here. Well, if you take a posit of any precision, flip the first bit, and shift it two, two bits to the right, you get that magenta curve. That's like 60 picoseconds worth of work. It's less than a clock cycle. These things are naturals for deep learning. They make sigmoid functions. Instead of taking 100 clock cycles to evaluate that green, si green thing, you can do it in less than a clock cycle. It would be trivial to get perfect sigmoid functions out of these things. In fact, Isaac uh, Yonemoto calls these things sigmoid numbers because he likes that property so much. But we have actually managed to train neural networks all the way down to 8-bit precision. Now you'll see that NVIDIA in the Volta processor and uh, you, you see stuff from Google where they're using 16-bit numbers that are kind of modified fixed point numbers. But they really can't get below 16 very well. We took it down all the way to 7 and at 7 it failed. But with posits, you can use 8-bit numbers to train neural networks, and the training is the hard part. Of course, you can also use them on the inference side. That's easy, comparatively. But I think this is going to eat double and maybe quadruple the speed at which we can do deep learning training. Let me take you through um, a comparison of floats with, with uh, posits, just on the unary operations like reciprocal square root, square log, and so on. So here's a plot where I took all the errors and I sorted them from left to right from lowest to, large, to lowest to largest error. You can see there's an area, area where they're exact. There's no error. They actually reciprocal, like the reciprocal of one half is exactly two, and you can represent that in both systems, so there's no error. Then you start to get some errors in the floats, but the posits are still kicking at, at no error, and then they gradually creep up. But at no point do you get more error. In fact, the, the, the error in the <laughs> floats goes to infinity, and then it dies because there's a lot of numbers you can't even reciprocal. Whereas the posits, every number has a reciprocal. Every number. And most of them are pretty accurate. I can actually do bar graphs as to what fraction are exact or inexact. And, well, they don't overflow and they don't underflow, so that's looking pretty good. It starts to get even more serious when you think, take a look at things like square root, where the, the accuracy is uniformly twice as high. And now we've got an 8-bit number. People say, well, is that just because it's 8 bits? Say, if you use a 32-bit number, you'll be, have a hard time seeing the magenta graph because it'll be glued to the x-axis. It barely, it's 30 times more accurate for posits than for floats if I go to 32-bit precision, and even worse for 64-bit. So by using a very low precision, I actually make it possible to see the advantage. That's what it is for squaring a number. Yikes. Okay, that's, that's pretty dramatic. Logarithm, it looks a lot like the square root. By the way, these NANs, I still have not a number, because I, can, I, I can't take the logarithm or the square root of a negative number. But uh, maybe offline I can tell you what I plan to do with NANs. But there is no NAN number that the hardware then has to deal with. If you are creating a lot of NAN, not a numbers in your application, finish writing it. You're not done with the software. If this happens to you all the time and you haven't figured out how to put an if statement to guard against that happening, you, you haven't finished your software yet. And you're not, you shouldn't be using as fast as possible type arithmetic until you do that. And there's 2 to the x. 
another case where there's a critical overflow and underflow, uh, but it doesn't happen with posits. But for round two, now let's get down to plus minus times divide. This is the hard part. This is why I went down to eight bits. It's because I wanted to actually examine 64K possible uh, cases and look at them all. You're going to have to color code it. You're not going to be able to see the numbers, right, uh, of, of the addition tables. But I, I'm going to say black is exact. Magenta is inexact. There's an error there, but it did run here. And the more bright the magenta, the bigger the error. So if it was just a tiny error, it would almost look like black. Red is overflow, blue is underflow, uh, uh, yeah, blue is underflow, and gold is not a number. It totally crashed. Here's what it looks like for addition closure. Oops. Yeah, right. What's going on here? Yeah, that's right. That's what addition looks like with floats. You got a strip of black down the diagonal where you're taking a number added to kind of close to the negative version of that. But uh, you've got an awful lot of error, but then you've got these underflow regions, and I mean overflow regions that are bright red here, and it's all framed by a bunch of not a number things that happen because of all those not a number things that are in the floating point standard. Here's what it looks like for posits. There actually is a not a number. You've got to squint to see it. And I think there's one up there too. No, nope, that's it. If you add infinity, to infinity, plus or minus, you don't know the sign of it, so that's not a number. You can't do that. Other than that, it's closed. Hmm. Okay. That's what the float uh, add, uh, addition versus positive addition looks like if you graph the errors. Let's take a look at multiplication. Whoa. Look at all that overflow. Look at all that underflow. Pretty bad. They actually get a pretty good number that are exact. 22% exact. And that's more than I can get with posits, but look at the cost they pay. All of that overflow, overflow and underflow possible uh, ability, it goes away with posits. Again, these are mathematical constructs. They just, you can kind of see the hyperbolic structure of the whole thing, and it just looks right. It doesn't look like it was designed by committee. And I've, again, the sorted losses. If you could multiply that much more accurately using the same number of bits, my hope and dream is you find you don't need 64 bits anymore for your application. So let me, let me take you through a, just a couple of uh, actual calculations using this stuff. Like, I call this accuracy on a 32-bit budget. Here's a big formula. Calculate it with whatever your favorite number system is. You can play with rounding modes. You can play with, I don't care, just use any, whatever you think is a great kind of arithmetic, try calculating 27 tenths minus E. Ooh, that's like 2.7 minus E. I just scraped off two decimals, didn't I? Uh, pi minus, that looks innocent, root 2 plus root 3, until you find out that root 2 plus root 3 is 3.14, dot, dot, dot. Whoopsie. I just scraped off three more decimals in the denominator. And so I've got divided differences where both of them are magnifying the inaccuracy, and to make it even worse, I take it to a power, which always makes errors even bigger. And the correct answer I show there is to, what is that, uh, 11 decimal places? And so the benchmark, instead of doing it as fast as possible, is show me how many bits of decimals right you can get with your number system. So with an IEEE afloat, I only get three decimals right because of the magnification going on here. If I use 32-bit posits without fused operations, I get twice as many decimals, six decimals. And if you knew you had six decimals in an answer, wouldn't that often be enough? I mean, the only reason you carry around 15 decimals is in the hope that you'll have three that are right in your answer, because you probably only need three. So it's, I, if you're using 15 decimals everywhere, it's sort of like insuring your car for $2 million, because you don't know how much it's worth. And then you complain about how big the premiums are. Very expensive. Well, <laughs> okay, then don't do that. I, there's something called fused operations that actually can get me even more decimals like that, uh, where you, uh, th there's a, uh, uh, kind of a scratch pad area, but it's a separate operation to use the scratch pad, so you don't get confused as to which one you're using. So a positive speed floats at both dynamic range and uh, accuracy. I don't have time to show you my FFT results, but I kind of fell off my chair when I tried it, because I, I did an FFT, of a 1,000 one point FFT, it's very standard, complex numbers, and then did the inverse FFT, and I tried to see how many, what's the error between my original signal and my uh, forward, backward, inverse, uh, FFT result. And with posits, I got every bit back. 
exactly. I'd never seen a real number type calculation produce an exact inverse with a Fourier transform before. I turned down the accuracy, I turned it down, I turned it down to 21 bits and it still worked. At 20 bits, I started to see a lapse. I started to see some errors pop up. But I look at the way that people are struggling to do fast Fourier transforms like for the square kilometer array. They're using 64-bit numbers to store the results of the SKA. And they can get away with 21 bits. And that's a third of the storage. That would save millions of dollars on storage if they you know, planned for this. So maybe the next generation of the SKA can start to look at positive arithmetic. All right, let's do the big one, LINPAC. This is what we all base on the top 500 on, right? Well, the original LINPAC wasn't uh, unlimited in scale until I managed to talk Don Guerra into making it a scalable benchmark. He used 100 by 100 uh, as the problem until it got just so small that it was silly. You fill it up with random numbers, and then you make a B right-hand side such that the correct answer is all ones in the, in the answer vector. So you just stick X, multiply A times X, which means adding up the row, and use that for your B value. So the, we know in advance that the answer should be all ones, and it's easy to take a glance and see whether you've really uh, bollocked up your, your, <laughs> your algorithm, because you won't get anything that looks like ones. Usually the answers are catastrophically wrong. And uh, I did the classic L, uh, LINPAC algorithm, which is LU factorization with partial pivoting, and I allow refinement using a residual. Yeah, you don't have to do that, but with IEEE 16-bit floats, well, it was kind of interesting to try turning down since they're available right now, right? I mean, NVIDIA actually has them in native hardware, and Intel is moving to supporting 16-bit floats, half-precision floats in hardware. And the maximum error was pretty bad of 0.01, only, only two decimals of accuracy. Uh, well, let's see how many decimals of accuracy I can get with posits. There wasn't any loss of accuracy. I got all ones. Every single entry was exactly one. And that made me think, I think we've got a broken benchmark. Because if I can get the exact answer with 16-bit posits and 64-bit numbers aren't anything like exact, why are we doing it that way? Why would anybody do it that way? So I did it with 16-bit, 64-bit floats, and that was the answer. I, that's what they looked like. There wasn't a single answer in this x vector that was exactly one. It never hit it. Always missed by many places, you know, bits in the last place, up and down, left and right. And of course, as I say, 16-bit posits nail it. So the people who are setting the rules of the benchmark will continue to say you must use 64 bits even though you don't need to. And you can't use Strassen multiplication because that would spoil our operation count. And you can't use uh, iterative refinement because then you could get the exact answer and we can't allow that. Uh, you know, once a benchmark drifts that far from real world computing, it's really looking silly. There's an event, I think it's still in the Olympics, called a walking race, where you have to walk. You can't take more than one foot off the ground, so you wind up walking like four or five miles an hour, and almost everybody disqualifies because it's just so hard not to break into a run <laughs> and go 15 miles an hour, right? <laughs> what we have with LINPAC and the top 500 is a walking race. So for building posit ships, the race is on, we got real hardware. The regime shifter is about the only thing we had to develop because that was kind of strange that those regime bits in the beginning. The rest just looks like standard float stuff. Barrel shifters, integer adders, integer multipliers, carry look ahead. It's all the stuff we've known how to build for decades and decades. Uh, so we've got barrel log. They're simpler, they're less area because they don't have all these crazy rules they stuck into the IEEE. Do you know that in IEEE, the square root of negative zero must be negative zero? What were they smoking? I mean, this was Berkeley, it was the 80s, so I can understand that controlled substances were probably involved, but I still can't find anybody who can tell me why the square root of negative zero is negative zero, but it makes work for the hardware designer when they have to obey rules like that. Rex Computing is shipping us a multiprocessor computer at the end of August that will have posits in it. They're well along. We're gonna get to play with the hardware. This is not just a software simulation. There are others coming. Posit Research has founded, it is uh, forming in, based in Singapore, to, but it's uh, got Bangalore and, uh, and US offices as well to completely fill out the hardware software application stack because they see the writing on the wall. This really looks ideal for GPUs. I mean, when you want pixels on the screen, really using as GPUs, not as accelerators, then how you get those pixels there, you don't care what's under the hood. So one of the easiest things to, to start with is 
changing the graphics libraries to just use these and, and get the job done. Another place is embedded computing where you're not necessarily trading the data with everybody outside world, looking at it, making sure it's compatible with other people's bit formats. And deep learning, look at all the people who are inventing their own data uh, formats to, to do stuff uh, with 16-bit numbers, but they really ought to go all the way down to posits and be able to do it with eight. I've got interest from Google, Intel, Samsung, NVIDIA. I look someday, forward someday to have a, a wall of logos like we just saw in the previous talk. That would be great we are forming a, uh, a consortium for next generation arithmetic that will be an international consortium of people interested in making this transition. Lawrence Livermore, unknown to me, would pick these things up and started trying them on their, their codes. They've got proxy codes for shock hydrodynamics, Lulesh and uh, uh, incompressible fluid flow, that's the Euler 2D, and they were getting three and four decimals more accuracy on their end results than they got with floating point arithmetic from I, the, the standard. And they're all in. They've got a team of 11 people coding these things up now. As I say, the consortium is forming. It will meet as a birds of a feather group at Supercomputing in, uh, in Denver. And we will have an annual meeting that will really get together all the interested players in March of, uh, uh, March of 2018 at the Supercomputing Asia conference that will be held in Singapore. So 32-bit precision, I'm hoping, will suffice where we have been using 64. Early computers, really early computers, like until anything, everything before the IBM System 360, that was the big watershed, they used six bit bytes and six bytes per word. So they were 36 bit machines and it worked. You could express characters with six bits, you know, capital letters maybe and numbers, but that's it. And 36 bits as a floating point number turned out to work for almost everything and people generally used it. Double precision, 72 bits, was something you'd do maybe to check your answer, but you certainly wouldn't do that in production code. But then when they went down to 32, it wasn't quite enough. It, uh, and people said, oh my God, we could go to 64-bit precision. And then you had CDC and Seymour Cray started building 60-bit machines and the 64-bit Cray 1 as a native type in order to support the new need for higher precision than 32. But what if 32-bit posits could replace 64-bit floats for a big data workload? That's like a turn of Moore's law, and Moore's law is slowing down. So if you want to know what to do beyond Moore's law, well, one thing is to replace your floating point with posits, because that'll give you a 2x shortcut to exascale, maybe more, especially if I can go all the way from 64 down to 16. I'm increasingly finding I can get away with 16-bit posits. They have four decimals of accuracy, and they maintain four decimals of accuracy throughout the calculation. And if you get four decimals of correct answer, like in a fluids code, why wouldn't that not, not be enough? Now, I have to say, in Singapore, uh, Europeans are rare. I suppose they think we all look alike. But because of my ruddy complexion and my reddish blonde hair, I get told about once a week that I look like Donald Trump. So I thought maybe I should have a cap made up. Make single precision great again. <laughs> so, in summary, better accuracy with fewer bits, consistent portable results, automatic control of rounding errors. I can do stuff for you in a compiler that you don't have to, you don't need numerical analysis anymore. I can automate it. It's a clean mathematical design, finally, and it reduces the energy of you're using, longer battery life, the power that goes into a, into a supercomputer center, or a, a data center the bandwidth that's, uh, that you're wrestling with in your network transmissions and just between memory and chip, the storage costs of all the mass storage and programming costs because now you get the same answer every time and you don't have people tearing their hair out for hours wondering why do I get a different answer on these two machines? Why do I get a different answer every time I submit this data set? That stops happening. Potentially I think that could have the cost for all the abundant data challenges that we see before us right now. So. Here's some more information for you. I didn't put in a plug for my book, which is called The End of Error, Unum Computing, but it's been out since 2015 and was a bestseller in its category on Amazon for a lot of that period. But uh, it does not have this latest development in it. So I'll caution you that if you read the book, you'll get all the things that are leading up to this development and the motivations for it and a lot more on the history, but you won't get a description of posits. I need to do that in a second edition. But we now have a posithub.org that's supposed to be a central repository for information. And on my own 
website, I've got the posting of a 16-page paper that will explain in more detail how to actually create this format and use it. I think these things are coming. Thank you very much. What kind of silicon? Well, yes, it's, that's what people are doing is they're dropping the FPU out, the floating point unit, and replacing it with a positive mathematical unit, a PMU, and everything else should work exactly the same. You can keep the instructions set. I, I think eventually we'll have to do that. You know, when the big boys get in there, like IBM and Intel, they'll probably offer a switch that will give you a mode of operation. It'd be like, as I said, you have, you have, for a while you have to support both, and then eventually one goes away. But what I think uh, both Posit uh, Research and Rex Computing are doing is they're going to de deliver side-by-side -side systems. Here's a Linux distribution running on this machine, and it's ru running floats. Here's, here's the same thing, except it's running posits. So you have a nice, clean, side-by-side -side comparison. Try your application. Try your application, see what kind of things happen to you. And once people see that it's running really well with posits, then they can say, let's try it with less precision. Hey, it's still running OK. OK, we're in. We can do it with half as much. I think that's about as pain-free pain as I can make it. It's, it's just recompile. Hope. There was, yeah. How do you plan to get at least one man into the uh, it's the plus or minus infinity. Think what happens when you've got an infinity. Infinity plus anything is infinity. Infin infinity divided by anything is infinity. And so on. So once you, you hit that infinity thing, it tends to stick there. So that serves as you're not a number. It will mark your calculation as you, you, wrote, <laughs> you threw a gutter ball, dude. <laughs> yes. That's right. Right. Yeah, uh, people also doing financial trading use it too. We, I, we didn't get the data. We don't want to trade the stock because you don't have this information. So you need a quiet NAN. And the default behavior is every, that plus or minus infinity behaves as your quiet NAN. And it will mark you and stop you from doing anything. But I, I tend to put the responsibility out to the software uh, writer that if you're, if, you're, if you're caring about these things as not a number, your code needs to recognize that it can happen and guard against it. It's really simple to do. It's an if statement. If you're asking the hardware to guard against it, then you're asking for the hardware to kind of replace some of your coding effort. Right. Right. And you'll be able to compute at full speed with posits. Uh, you actually use infinities in your space? So we can talk about this offline, but I, I do have some solutions. I'm trying to avoid two modes of operation because I hate having modes, uh, mode bits. But one mode is that infinity is separate and that a not a number produces an interrupt. An interrupt will go to whatever handler you want and either report it or continue computing with a, with a however. But I can still support quiet NAN and signaling NAN. I understand the need to do that. I don't see particularly the need to support all the other different kinds of NAN, but in the C99 standard, it says you have to report differences like square root of a negative number, log of a negative number, arc sign of a greater than one, uh, all these things. But that's very easily done by the compiler, right? You can easily say the, the, the function when you call sign, if it does this, then that's at the point where you report it. So the C language or any other language needs to be able to, to control what you see. One of the big mistakes with the IEEE standard was putting flags in the register, in the, in the processor control register that nobody ever sees. And you'd have to know assembler to find out what they're saying. You'd have to dig them out of there. So everything you do is, as a rule, in the, uh, if there's a posit standard, I hope there ever, never is one. I don't want to let IEEE anywhere near this thing. But if there is, uh, it's, it's, you can't have hidden things in the processor. They have to be very explicitly visible in the source code that you write as to how things are going to be handled and what you're doing about it. Then you've got maintainable, repeatable code. Oh, wait, one more. Yes. Uh, thank you very little. That was, that was fun. Um, 
I, uh, before I worked in, in HPC, I used to work in the embedded kind of programming space on 8-bit mm -hmm. processors, and if, if you tried to use a float anywhere, it would be like kicking a puppy. It was very, very you know, frowned yes. upon. Right. Um, and so I guess we've talked about you know, the, the high end of things, but I can imagine this also affects kind of what we now call Internet of Things and That's edge right. computing, where they're trying to stuff a lot of processing, but they're really power constrained, right. they're really cost constrained. Um, do you have interest, I suppose, at the other end of, of the computing space where you are? Certainly, yeah. Internet of Things constrained. is another big area. Uh, both Samsung and, and some startup companies I'm aware of are very interested in using this in their FPGAs. Well, you know, in an FPGA, you get to total flexibility as to how many bits you use. You can have a 23-bit float or something crazy because you want to save on all the space that you're taking inside the FPGA. So uh, one of the things that Posit Research wants to do is to build up the libraries of FPGA uh, things that you can dial up or down all these different combinations of, uh, of posits to be exactly what you need, and then you'll be able to either get more, more processing squeezed into the FPGA or uh, use less energy. Uh, whatever is the constraint, because it's a really, really big deal, of course, as you say. So embedded is going to be one of the killers, uh, where you, you want to squeeze the, the, the number of precision bits down as small as possible and still get an acceptable answer. There was a paper written where got, somebody tried the older Unum arithmetic, and they got an 80% savings on an embedded application. Huge savings. It was some kind of medical embedded device. And so if you, if you start looking in Google Scholar for publications, they're starting to pop up all over that people are getting better results by not using floating point numbers, but, but switching to these. Yeah? Okay, this one. Yeah. Andreas. No, unums always can be used sort of like I do here, where every time I do an a calculation, I get the uncertainty bit, pick the center. Do it again, pick the center, pick the center. After all, I said, okay, throw out that uncertainty bit and use it as another fraction bit. Now design such that everything is fixed size. But I've got three types of unums going, type one, two, and three. What I just showed you I would call type three. It's very close to type two because it uses that ring of projective reals. But I prescribe exactly what the values are, which is uh, much less general than type two. And I give up the idea of exact reciprocals everywhere. So I guess it is a new type. But there's that two philosophies. You can do things as fast and good enough or really mathematically accurate with type one, two, and three unums. And I think the big impact is the one I just showed you. Good enough and fast, but much better than close. <laughs> was one more there, yeah. John, do you have any response from IEEE? I mean, do you have the vision that you want to make the policy an IEEE a standard? Yeah, the IEEE president contacted me and said, when can we make it a standard? And I said, I don't think I'm done with this yet. I want to see a lot more experience, a lot more use, a lot of more people finding out how do we want to handle NAND, for example. Which way is the default? If we have to have modes, I want to know real life experience. What did people want to be the default behavior? So I held off, and I'm really glad I held off because there's been so many advances in making these things better than when they begged me to form a standards committee. But I also really dread the idea of a standards committee with hardware designers and industry executives, mostly from marketing, not mathematics, who have their own agendas trying to twi twist and tweak this thing. I've already had people from Intel saying, hey, that, that looks like you've got too many exponent bits there. Can we put a hard limit and say they can never get bigger than this? Because that'd be a lot easier to build. And I tried it, and it totally breaks the system. But I can just imagine fighting these kinds of things in an IEEE committee and saying, no, it's got to be the right answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't get to cheat. And I said, oh, come on. And I got this from, uh, what, there was another designer who said the same thing to me. He was just hired on in Bangalore for posit research. He was also trying to get me to, you know, just kind of shade the truth a little bit on the numbers because then they could you know, make something simpler to design. It wasn't even faster. It wasn't even smaller, but it was easier to design. I don't want these people on my committee. I just don't. <laughs> I think the, the standard will be a lot like RISC-V. You think about this consortium I'm talking about. It's, it's, uh, Risk v is not an IEEE standard, but it's a standard. It's open source. Everything I do is open source, by the way. There's no intellectual property ownership whatsoever here. It's given away under the MIT open source license. So if you want to give it away for free yourself, if you want to modify it and give it away, that's fine. If you want to sell it, that's fine. Just don't sue me. That's the only condition on the MIT source license is I'm protected from liability if this stuff doesn't work. But otherwise, I'm giving it away like an academic. And I did that by giving myself a sabbatical. Uh, 
after I left Intel, I went to AMD and tried to get them to look at these things. Then I left AMD and I thought, okay, now I'm not under any intellectual property agreement. I can, <laughs> I can open source this and not have to worry. So I did it all while I was not formally employed by any of those employers that have those agreements. Anyone else? Ah, yes. John. I, I think you're, uh, oh, the question, how do I know they're accurate? It is possible to verify a lot of calculations. Um, this gets kind of technical, but if you have an exact dot product accumulator, which is one part of the posits idea, then you can take any basic block of plus minus times divide and formulate it in the form of an, a lower triangular matrix. This was discovered by Ulrich Kulish in the 80s. And when you do that, you can solve AX equals B with the long, lower triangular matrix and always guarantee that it's accurate to within one half of an ulp. So only when you have things more complicated than plus minus times divide and you don't have a basic block, uh, that's going to really, really improve the, the accuracy. But I, I, if people are really concerned about how do you, you know you're getting exactly the right result, I point them to the interval style valids, which have plenty of support for doing bounded calculations and also have uh, features that interval arithmetic doesn't have that prevent them from blooming to minus infinity to infinity as the bound for your answer. They stay tight. They only grow by like one unit in the last place for every calculation. I got really technical. More than I wanted to. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone.